I'm Marcia Alchison, Interfaith Interconnect Leadership Coordinator, and welcome to Interfaith Interconnect Religion Chat today. We're very glad to have you all here. Um, starting out on a sad note, we just learned that there was a shooting in a high school in Florida this afternoon, and several students were killed. So I'd like to begin today with a moment of silence in remembrance of those who have died. Thank you. I'm wondering how many people are here at Religion Chat for the first time? Raise your hand for the first time. Great. Great. And I'm wondering how many people are here at Muslim Community Center for the first time? Wow. Good. 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 We're very grateful to MCC for, their, for hosting today. They're always so warm and welcoming and generous anytime we want to hold one of our events here. And we really appreciate that. Thank you, Mayor. Um, a couple of, of um, announcements. Restrooms are off to my left, that corner. Um, the banquet hall and the prayer room, is that the right? Thing to call it okay out that door and the way we're going to operate today is that the two speakers will each speak as usual and then when they're finished um, there are refreshments in the banquet hall you can go get refreshments and come back and break into small groups as we usually do for discussion or you could also um, join the others for prayer that will start about 10 minutes to 6 you're welcome to do that also so when we're, when we're finished with this, uh, the speakers, then I'll announce that at that time, just to give you a feel for what's going on. We hold Religion Chat the second Wednesday of the month, and we welcome your suggestions for topics. Um, if for next, um, for the March Religion Chat, we <coughs> confirm speakers, and we're going to do a new topic. We'll be meeting in Livermore, but we don't have the location yet, so watch your, um, your email box for, for details. As is our custom, we'll begin today's program with our mission statement. To enrich, inform, and educate ourselves and others about the great diversity of faiths and cultures in our valley. Today we are holding the last of... Oh, March, I'm just wondering for the new people, we be sure we get their emails so that uh, there's a sheet going around to sign up. Be sure they give us their emails, and then, then they'll keep, be able to keep in touch. Thank you, Ellen. I meant to say that. Thanks for reminding me. Um, uh, we have a, a sign-in list going around. Some people came in that way and signed in, but if you signed in and didn't write your email and you want us to have your email, go ahead and add that. And then people came in the other door did not sign in probably. So if you could do that as we're going. We're holding, today we're holding the last of, of three religion chat sessions on the topic, what behaviors will get you thrown out of your religion? How has it changed through the years? And we heard from a Catholic, Episcopalian, Muslim, and Hindu in the previous two chats. And today we are going to be hearing from Ken Black, who is from Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Livermore Stake and Chris Andrus of Presbyterian Church in America, Canyon Creek Presbyterian in San Ramon. Um, so each speaker will take up to 20 minutes all together, which will include time for questions. And then, as I said, we'll break into small discussion groups. If that's informal time, you can go into the banquet hall or into, in, into the prayer room instead if you want to do that. So I would first like to welcome and introduce Ken Black. Thank you. Thank you. 
So to just uh, briefly answer the question, I don't know. I've never been thrown out of the church, so. <laughs> um, I'm going to, I, I'm, I have a well-known bad habit of going over time when I'm speaking, so maybe between technology and, and Marsha waving at me, maybe I can stick to this. So to, to lay the groundwork for this, I think I need to have some framework to work from. This sort of falls under the broad umbrella of what we call, refer to as church discipline in our religion. And so to, to really understand the answer to this question or these questions, I kind of need to paint the picture so you understand the framework that we operate in um, as we perform church discipline. We as leaders uh, in the church are doing this. Um, so I, th I think to really understand what motivates the way we do things. Um, I, I probably need to make this one statement that sort of gets to some of the underlying uh, beliefs and doctrines that we have. I think there's two things that really are key to uh, church discipline. This one is more broad-based, and that is that the church was established by and is led by the Savior Jesus Christ, and that we as mortals are not free to change His commandments or modify His will. So with, with that in mind, uh, I think the next key element of this is that um, our primary goal, I guess, as church leadership and church members who are not necessarily in leadership, um, is to help people grow and become more like the Savior, to, to continually develop and uh, become better people, become more Christ-like in the way they, that they live their lives and their interactions with other people. So that's really what we try to do as we operate programs and do things within the church. Um, now church discipline is a, is a pretty broad subject and the thought of addressing this in 15 minutes was a little daunting. And so uh, the approach I'm going to try to take is skim over the top, but give you enough of a, an explanation so you have enough concept to be able to ask questions. And maybe, maybe between what I say and, and the questions that I feel we can kind of address your, your questions and maybe give you a better feel for how this works for us. Um, so one of the things that we try to do I think is really our focus is not to not to throw people out. Uh, again, if you think about the purpose of trying to help people become more like the Savior. Uh, driving them out of the church is probably not going to advance that goal. So we try to, if there is a disciplinary problem or if they're doing something that really is not um, appropriate, we really try to work with them as ecclesiastical leaders and try to help them change and repent and, and get their lives in order. Um, but anyway, I'll get to what some of those things are. So, within this umbrella of church discipline, there's, there's informal and formal discipline, and I'm going to focus mostly on, well, I'll talk about both. Um, but to bring about formal discipline, the, there's three purposes of that really, if we are going to initiate the process of formal discipline. And this is what we call a disciplinary council. So the three purposes, the, the number one is to help the individual, the transgressor, to get their life in order and strive to follow the Savior better. Okay, that's the number one. And most of what we deal with in disciplinary issues has to do with that particular issue. The second and third one, uh, some of them are somewhat corollary, but the second one is to protect the innocent. Okay, now sometimes that's a real issue, sometimes it's not. But if we're dealing with, for instance, uh, a child molester, there, there's a clear issue there. Or somebody who's uh, maybe involved in, in illegal activities and taking advantage of people and things like that were innocent people are going to be affected, then that would be uh, a key element. And then the third one is to protect the integrity of the church. And there's a couple of different things involved in that, but again, it's, um, that one is rare. It's usually uh, the first one. 
So let me talk about um, the typical process that, that happens. Most, in most cases, it's initiated when a member of the church approaches their local ecclesiastical leader. And I guess just to give you a framework, some of you may be aware of this, but um, we're organized geographically. So, like I represent today, <clears throat> today the Livermore Stake, which is a geographical area that includes congregations in Livermore and also a congregation of young single adults that cover the Tri-Valley area that are also assigned to us geographically. So, in the stake we have what we call wards, which is the geographic entity that we function in. A ward is led by a bishop, okay, so he's, he's the, the pastor, the leader of the church. Uh, and then within the stake we have stake organizations that coordinate multi-ward multi activities and things like that. And there's a leadership team that is led by a president and two counselors, and, and he's referred to as the stake president. So he has ecclesiastical leadership over all of Livermore and the bishops that function under him. So typically what would happen is someone would approach their bishop and say, Bishop, I need to talk to you. I've got something that I'm struggling with. And that would begin the process. So they, they would have their um, conversation, private conversations, obviously. And whatever it is, the bishop would try to work with that individual to help them. And most of it never goes beyond that point. The bishop is able to deal with a lot of disciplinary issues, people that are struggling with whatever it is, you know, maybe infidelity or, or uh, spousal abuse or, I, I don't know, that one's probably a little extreme uh, because that can get into the area of uh, illegal activity. But um, it could be struggling with sexual addiction or, or whatever. So that's where it starts. And the bishop can do what we call informal discipline. He can, he can work with the individual, obviously, counsel them, work with them, whatever the case may be that they need. And, that's, and nobody else knows about it, and, that, and it stays there. If um, it's something serious enough that the bishop feels that there needs to be more, that there may be a need to take this to the next level. Um, then there's, there's what's called a disciplinary council, and there's two types of those. So the first one is done at the ward level, and that involves the bishop and his two counselors, and it is um, a council, if you will, where the four people would gather together and talk about what the problem is. Now, Having said that, generally the bishop and the individual are the only ones who know all the details. This is not a fishing expedition or anything like this. The only thing that's shared is what's key information that needs to be shared. And again, the focus of this is to help the individual overcome their problems, get their lives back in order, and try to become better at following the Savior and His commandments. Um, Any time a bishop feels like there may be a need for a disciplinary council. He needs to consult with the stake president. Um, in certain cases, uh, a disciplinary council at the ward level is not um, appropriate. It needs to go to a stake level, a higher level. And that typically involves um, transgressions that involve um, either people in higher levels of leadership within the church and typically for um, the priesthood leaders in the church, or priesthood holders in the church who have uh, made the higher level of covenants, and then it goes to the stake level. So let's talk about the ward level for a minute here. Um, as I said, it's just the bishop and his two counselors. And this is really... I want to tell you what it's not. This is not, a, as I mentioned, it's not a fishing expedition. Um, it is not uh, legalistic. It's not um, adversarial. It's very much um, a council focused on love. I've been a part of these a number of times, and I can tell you every single time 
it's not only a deeply spiritual experience, it, it's heartbreaking at times. It can be very heartbreaking as you empathize and feel for what people are struggling with. And some of them are really challenging, as you can imagine. But the, the focus is really on how can we bless the life of this individual? What can we do for them? What is best for them? And to some degree, like the concept of tough love that those of us understand who've had teenagers, we haven't always had to apply that, but we understand the concept, right? Sometimes people need to be jolted a little bit to, to kind of have to make a decision. Which side of the fence am I going to go on? Or am I, you know, I can't sit on the fence. I've got to go one way or the other. So what are the possible outcomes? So the disciplinary council typically is 30 minutes, an hour. Sometimes they can go much longer. Um, that's probably fairly rare. Um, a couple of factors that can influence that. Uh, so there's several outcomes. There's actually four. The first one is no action, um, no formal action. So it could just be the bishop continues to work with an individual. Uh, the second outcome would be um, informal probation, what it's called, which is just a slight step above that. It might involve some restriction of of privileges. For example, the person may be asked not to partake of the sacrament or the communion um, for a period of time, or they may be instructed to do something or, you know, whatever, <coughs> to try to help them um, recognize the severity of what they're doing and demonstrate some uh, sense of um, remorse and help in the repentance process. The third level then would be what we call disfellowshipment, which is again another step up, um, a little more formal, a little more restrictive. That generally involves some period, spe specified period of time, it might be six months or a year, or it could be semi indeterminate. But that usually involves um, a number of things. They're not allowed to do public prayers in the church, they're not allowed to callings or assignments in the church where they might be teaching or speaking in our worship service, things like that. And then the, the highest level, and that's you know, getting thrown out of the church, um, is what we refer to as excommunication. And in that case, they actually do lose their membership, their names are removed from, from the records of the church. And in that case, it's at least one year. Now, we don't kick them out. That's the last thing we want to do. We want them to continue to come to church. We want them to continue to work with their bishop and their stake president to try to get their <coughs> lives in order. And so that, that's really the focus of that. So after whatever period of time, if there's been formal discipline like that, um, there is a reconvening at the point where the bishop or, and or the stake president feel that the person is ready. There's a reconvening of this disciplinary council and the person comes back and everything is reviewed again, not their transgression, but what have they done to overcome it and get their lives in order. And if everything's in order, then at that point um, their fellowship is restored or if they were excommunicated they can be rebaptized into the church as if it had never happened. And they go, they go back, their membership record shows their original baptism date and all those sorts of things. So. Again, it's very focused on the individual and focused on um, encouraging them to, to move forward in their lives. So, I'm running short on time. Let me just briefly touch on this, and these are fairly short things. So, what can get you thrown out? So, excommunication could result from, and there are no hard and fast, but I'll tell you some of these things, um, you know, you go into some of these, it's like, it's hard to imagine that this will not result in excommunication, but we always try to, to, to really follow the Spirit, to, to have the Spirit of the Lord guide us in this process because we, we recognize the significance and the importance of what we're doing here. So a couple of ideas or a couple of things that could result in excommunication. <clears throat> Some of these are uh, mandatory convening of the disciplinary council and some are not, but all of these could. So sexual sins such as adultery, fornication, or homosexual relations. Apostasy, which 
to define as a repeated, clear, and open opposition to the church, its leaders, and its doctrine. And again, that's repeated, clear, and open. This is not people disagreeing. It's, these are the ones you're going to see in the media, right? The big ones that make the news, um, where they're really trying to make it a very public thing. And then criminal activities of most any kind could, so, you know, child spousal and sexual abuse, um, dealing in child pornography, fraud, robbery, murder, rape, you know, all those sorts of things, um, illegal drug sales. So that gives you some idea of the things that could happen. So how has it changed over the years? My experience with this, direct experience goes back about you know, 15, 17, 18 years. I talked to a friend who spans the period before that, so covering the last 50 years, I'm not an expert on this, but for the last 50 years, uh, procedurally and, and in terms of the things that could get you excommunicated, virtually no change. It's, it's pretty much the same. I think there's a couple of minor things, for instance, um, now, if a member wants to have their name removed, they no longer want membership in the church, it's a procedural issue, um, administrative, as opposed to a disciplinary council, which is what had to be done many years ago. So, a few things like that, but um, pretty much it hasn't, really hasn't changed um, in quite a while. So, I'm at 16 minutes. Um, <laughs> questions? <laughs> yes? Uh, supposing I come to you and say, Bishop, there's something I want to talk to, to you about. I'm doing just fine in following the Savior, but Alan over here is a real scoundrel, and I think you need to you talk to him. Like me, wouldn't you? No, you were right there. I say give I me mean, his phone number. <laughs> so, so that does happen, and sometimes it's very legitimate, right? So you talk about maybe child abuse. Um, that might be one where somebody doesn't walk in and say, hey, I'm a child abuser, I need help. Okay? So we would take those things very seriously and, and check it out. You also have to be careful, obviously. But, yeah, we would, we would act on that because we are very sensitive. Um, and sometimes it's just personal disputes and personalities, right? But, yeah, we would not ignore that. Yes? Yes. Um, so a parishioner is is excommunicated from the church. What happens if they were sealed in the temple of marriage? Is Great question. Same? So um, that is also nullified. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, there's a follow-up to that. So um, that's nullified as well. All blessings of membership and temple sealing is gone. As I mentioned, if they've been excommunicated, and that's only if they've been excommunicated. It doesn't happen otherwise. So after the year. If they, or whenever, after that minimum year, they can be rebaptized into the church that restores their membership. Mm -hmm. Okay, it does not restore temple blessing. Okay. There is an additional time period after that that's undefined, but might be another six months, a year, two years. It depends on what happened, the severity of what it was. Um, at that point, they can, again, under the advisement of the bishop and the state president, they can then say, this person really is ready to have all of their blessings restored, and that's the terminology we use, which would include their sealing in the temple, and the temple marriage and everything. At that point, they, they have to submit um, a recommendation to the first presidency in Salt Lake. They will review it. They review the records of, of the disciplinary council, which are kept, and if they approve it, then they will send someone to do a face-to-face -face interview with that person. If, if they approve that, then they, on the spot, will restore all of those blessings. And again, everything is restored as if nothing had ever happened. It's completely erased from back to the way it was originally. So Great what question. you're saying is that nobody is lightly kicked out of your church. No one is, is lightly kicked out of your church. Lightly, lightly kicked out. Oh, lightly. Yeah. lightly. Yes. If they have to do something really serious to be excommunicated. Yes, yeah. And you know, we really try, like I said, we really try to work with them. It's Chris Andrews, yeah, my uh, church is uh, Canyon Creek Presbyterian Church in San Ramon. And um, Ken actually uh, 
stole some of my thunder. A lot of the, uh, both in terms of procedurally and uh, even the issues, uh, is very similar, which which is, is not uh, maybe not that surprising in terms of um, you know, what would uh, initiate uh, church discipline. Uh, and we do, you know, we call it the same thing. We have uh, we have different levels. Presbyterian church government uh, is uh, works on different levels. Works on the local level first, informally. Uh, and that would be it could go to a formal, which is rare. Um, one of the things that uh, to add to what you were saying, uh, most issues are kind of resolved uh, informally, uh, either in the way of uh, you know people you know agreeing you know, to adjust their uh, their behavior, their, uh, or by going somewhere else. It's just the reality of, uh, of you know the, the society we live in. There are a lot of other places that people can go if they. Have a dispute with uh, the church that they're in. Uh, churches are voluntary associations, so um, you know, there is uh, there's nothing that um, really uh, keeping them. You know, that, that people are free to kind of come and go. So I think that really uh, ends up being the case the vast majority of times. Although there are on occasions uh, situations where it does go to formal uh, uh, church discipline, and for us, yeah, it's similar. It's it would be a matter of um, you know, being restricted. From really would be like the full privileges of membership. Historically, in Christianity, uh, it's always been regarded as uh, the communion has been regarded as kind of the, the focus of uh, kind of the height of your membership privileges. And actually, excommunication. A lot of people don't realize it really kind of focuses more on the communion. Excommunio was the original uh, term, and it did, it did have to do with being really a member in good standing, and you know, really still does. There are certainly. Uh, situations that arise where uh, a, a person is um, you know, is found to be uh, in, uh, in a situation. It's it's not even so much what they're doing. It's uh, the fact that they are unrepentant in activity, which is regarded as uh, is clearly regarded as sinful. And a lot of the same things that that Ken uh, listed would be there as well. What I'll add to it is um, just being a disruptive person and a person that. Uh, has unresolved uh, disputes, interpersonal disputes, and is showing no unwillingness to uh, reconcile in, in relationships. And of course, that applies to most of all the marriage relationship, but also you know, relationships within, uh, within the church otherwise. Uh, so the issue really is whether or not there's the willingness to be repentant. And the understanding of repentance is first to acknowledge uh, that there's sin going on, that they're, they've been guilty of sinful Behavior or uh, or you know, speech, uh, and then also then the commitment to uh, overcoming that sin, growing uh, growing out of that sin, uh, reverse, you know, confessing it, and asking the Lord's help to uh, to overcome it, so that uh, it is no longer an issue. And as with uh, the way Ken shared, the goal is always restorative. As far as kicking out, kicking people out of the church. The, uh, I've never known a case of that. Uh, theoretically, if somebody was uh, really wanting to remain a part of the church and was very disruptive, uh, it would go, in our case, if they went through the formal process, it would go from the, uh, the church congregational level up to the Presbytery Regional Church and conceivably up to the General Assembly, which is the entire denomination. And there's appeals, uh, much like there is in our system, uh, there's different courts of appeal. If they went through all that and still wanted to stay and were causing trouble, I guess, you know, at that point they could be kicked out uh, in terms of being uh, welcome in, you know, in the congregation to be a part of the congregation. I've never known that to happen because people usually will just, you know, at some point, well, be short of that, they'll decide, well, you know, I don't fit in here and, you know, go somewhere else. So that's usually the way it, uh, it goes. And as far as uh, the goal is always, the person would always be welcome. Too, even in a case like that, if they're willing to uh, you know, promote the uh, the peace of the church, that's one of the uh, membership questions that our members are asked. Uh, that, um, do you submit yourselves to the church's government and discipline, and promise to study her purity and peace, and also do you promise to support the church in her worship and work to the best of your ability? So, um, church being a voluntary organization, uh, it really it's a it's a place that you go and uh, when you have shared beliefs and practices with others. Um, we it probably, uh, 
it's, it's not thought of a lot, but I think it should be recognized that it's just not right for a person to join a group with the goal of, of causing it to change in order to conform with one's own beliefs and practice, practices. Mm -hmm. Instead, such a person should find a group that better fits their the beliefs and practices that they already have. So I think that you know, that understanding would, yeah, I think that does kind of come into play. It's pretty rare I think people are going to come in, it may happen on occasion, where they come in and they want to change a group. The beauty of America, the variety that we have here, is that there, uh, there are usually places that, uh, that fit their, uh, a person's beliefs and practices much, you know, quite well. So uh, that's usually what happens in, uh, with situations like that. Um, yeah, some of the stuff Ken covered already. Um, yes. Yeah, I also I wanted to add this too in the, in the whole area. This, this, I sort of detect a, a question behind the question about you know, what gets you kicked out. And, uh, and that is the, this idea that a voluntary association does have the right to determine its membership requirements. Uh, uh, we all understand that. And, and they do have the right to say, well, you're not really with us in spirit. So you know, unless you want to you know, kind of get with the program, and at least be willing to uh, you know, consider our point of view, then you probably should be somewhere else. Uh, that's, I think that's, that really is uh, sensible. Uh, also, it's, uh, we would say it's not right for the government, whether through court rulings or laws, to dictate the beliefs and membership standards of any private association. A lot of people today think that uh, the government does have the right to do this, but it's, I would suggest that you know, it's a very dangerous idea. Uh, and if the government does that, it really does deprive people of freedom of association, uh, freedom of speech, uh, even freedom of conscience, conceivably. And uh, there are some dangers in that area. Um, these freedoms must be protected, uh, even for people with whom, with whom we strongly disagree. And I always give an example, I think that maybe the most obvious example would be something like a, a, a racist group. And uh, you know, most people, myself included, really detest racism and people who are racist. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, uh, freedom means that we must allow people to, to be racist to some extent, and even to associate with other races, uh, perhaps white supremacist groups, it could be black supremacists, it could be religious supremacist groups. Uh, that's part of freedom that uh, such groups will, will exist. Uh, we do of course have the right to express strong opposition to their views and the messages. And uh, we may also seek to stop such people when they seek to, implode, to impose their, uh, their supremacist views on others. In fact, I would say even stronger, uh, I would say that we must uh, seek to stop people if they uh, seek to impose uh, you know, evil ideas Racist, whether, whether racist or otherwise, on society, we actually have an obligation to do that. But short of that, there is that that area of uh, freedom of association. I think it's a very important uh, thing to maintain. Let's see. As for being kicked out, really, ultimately, uh, for our church, uh, it's about relationship with God uh, and. We would say that, that God never will, will never kick out anyone who truly comes to Him in faith, and uh, even with areas of church discipline, as, as Ken mentioned, the goal is always restorative in terms of getting the person back into right relationship with our Lord and Savior, and in doing so, that leads to reconciliation, leads to improvement of relationships with one another. So that. That goal is always to uh, to call the person back to the faith that they professed, and to live according to that faith, and, and uh, to you know, continue on the road of <coughs> walking as as a, as a true disciple of Christ, walking in love, walking in fellowship with others. As for the uh, how it, the uh, this has changed over the years, uh, it, I would say in principle it has. I think the, uh, in our church we really hold, uh, we, we hold to the, uh, I would say literal understanding, that's a kind of dangerous adjective maybe use, but uh, adverb I guess it is. Uh, we would hold to a, uh, 
a you know, fairly literal understanding of like the Apostles' Creed of uh, we believe in biblical that the Bible is uh, was given by God. Uh, he guided the writer, human writers, to write exactly what he wanted. It's not men putting together their thoughts about God. It was from the from God down to us. Uh, so we would kind of we would hold to pretty much the same principles that came out of the Reformation. But in practice, it's a lot different. The practice has softened uh, through over the years. Uh, one of the things, in many cases, issues which would have come to the attention of the church in the past just don't anymore. Uh, that's, this is partly because of how society has changed. Uh, most people in the developed world today no longer live in the kind of close-knit communities that most people once lived, even in the cities. Uh, in the past, there was more of a sense of uh, people of one church you know, kind of live together uh, more, and certainly in the smaller towns, you don't have that anymore. Um, so there's a lot more privacy than there was in the past. Uh, it's also, I would say that what churches tend to do today is to pursue kind of a don't ask, don't tell <laughs> policy in many, in many areas. Um, and yeah, I, I, think that's a, I think that's a good thing. And part of that is the respect for the privacy, uh, even in churches. I've been a part of two Presbyterian denominations. One was a lot stricter uh, than the others doctrinally. And it was smaller congregations, so you did tend to have more of accountability naturally with it. The one I'm in now is a lot, uh, it's a lot bigger church, and there is uh, a lot of stuff that they don't know about. And as long as it doesn't become a divisive issue, it's not an issue. You know, really, there, um, it, is, uh, it doesn't cause problems for the church. So you know, that leads to really fewer public uh, church disputes than, than occurred in, in the past. Um, and the other aspect of that is that Churches just don't have the influence on society that they once did. We live in a much more secular culture today. Um, that can be seen to have a good side and a bad side. But that will be a, have to be a topic perhaps for another, uh, another meeting. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's pretty much what I have. Okay, right. I have a question yes. for both of you, actually. What is your feeling on gay and lesbian people? Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. I was going to mention that, and I, uh, I figured I would uh, not mention it specifically because there's a tendency for people to think that, that uh, conservative churches, churches that uh, hold to uh, traditional Christian teaching, would single out homosexuals. In reality, that's not true. Uh, I would can mention it too. Uh, um, as far as sexual, all forms of sexual sin, the, the uh, historic understanding of Christianity. Uh, really what we understand the Bible to be teaching is really that all sexual relationships outside of a faithful marital relationship between a husband and a wife and a woman, all, no matter what they are, are problematic or sinful. And that God gave us uh, sexual desires uh, for the goal of bringing male and female together you know, to be mates also, but also uh, and I, I would say that it's also the, the greatest expression, ideally, of the love of a man and a woman uh, would be their sexual relationship. Uh, in fact, it's interesting, Valentine's Day, uh, <laughs> maybe think about this. Of course, this is not a sexual area that uh, is true, but in some ways, that uh, you know, Valentine's Day, of course, is about love. And Christianity is very much about love, uh, but really love of a husband, a man, and a woman. Uh, as God designed us to come together as one. And, um, you know, it's interesting, it just, the, it can be said the message of, this is a little not quite related, but the message of Christianity can be seen to reflect uh, Valentine's Day in that uh, the message of Christianity is this, Almighty God, the Creator, Lord, and Judge of all, wants to be your Valentine if you are willing to let him. So that's just a, a thought I want to leave with you. But one other area that is the whole confusion kind of of sexual desire and love. Up until fairly recently, those, those were considered two separate things. And there's been a tendency today to, you know, really to expand or distort really the, the uh, to make love, you know, uh, akin to having it, like a sexual attraction to somebody else. And, and that is not the way it was historically understood, in fact, until quite recently. Um, yet it is helpful to have a historical perspective especially on an issue like uh, the LGBTQ uh, issues that are facing us today, uh, in that 
really up until about 30 years ago, virtually every religion, every historic religion, you know, you know centuries old, time-tested religion, and really this whole scientific world, really all of academia, uh, did not hold homosexuality to be as normal as heterosexual relations. And, you know, it's interesting, this has been one of those things where it's, there's been a, a very striking change in a short period of time. Whenever that happens, you have to, you have to really, you should really, I think, ask, well, you know, why is this happening? And, you know, it is, was everyone else up until recently wrong on this? And we would, we would say that uh, they weren't. And I think that what has happened in the last 30 years or so has been a uh, really kind of a, um, a departure from uh, human relations as God designed them. Okay. Thank you. Well, what if God, Joanne, uh, just in the interest of time and fairness, since uh, Chris only got one question, can, can, uh, does someone else have a question for Chris? And if, I'll be glad to talk with you further yeah, afterwards, okay. too. Yeah. And if not... I, I'm not going to be here afterwards. Okay. Okay. Um, go ahead. I do have um, a question. Mm -hmm. Kim was very clear about who you went to to speak to. Mm -hmm. um, is it the minister? Is it the head of the... You know, who... If you are feeling troubled, or do you come to the leadership, or does the leadership say you are a thorn in our side, a stone, a pebble in our shoe, and we are coming to you? I would say the latter. Very it almost never happens, really. But uh, yes, it's it's possible that it could. But yeah, it depends on what the issue is, really. I think sometimes things come to attention. You know, something like a criminal activity or something that comes to the attention if the person is not willing to go and say listen I have a problem because ideally if a person is caught up in a behavior that you know is clearly uh, it's clearly wrong they'll, they'll they will go seek help in the, you know in the church our church uh, it's there is a, a, a group of elders it's called the session of elders that uh, you know kind of similar to what Ken was uh, the council there that um, yeah, they're there in theory, although in reality, what tends to happen is people go to counselors kind of outside the, the church with Christian counselors or otherwise, and usually deal with it that way. And if they let the leadership of the church know, a lot of people just don't do this, really. They, they kind of work out all their stuff on their own, which can be good in a way, but it, you know, it also might lead to problems down the line, too. So, but it would be, uh, we would have to step the way ours would work. It would be informal. Uh, usually one of the elders or one of the pastors would, it would be, uh, more at an informal level, and if they can work things out, it's fine. If, if they can't, then they would take it to uh, the uh, the whole body of elders, uh, and then if that didn't work out, then they would go to the presbytery level. Kind of reflects actually Matthew chapter 18 has steps of how to deal with disagreements between uh, brothers and, and sisters in the church. So. Okay, we okay. have to stop right now. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, Chris. Let's. All right. time to talk with each other and then also people want to join for prayer they can so um, don't move yet but what I'd like you to um, talk about when you get into your small group what I suggest is um, what did you learn today that was new to you what are some differences and similarities between your own faith traditions view of the topic and what you heard today so those are just suggestions for discussion and we always encourage people to talk with someone you don't know. You may have met them before, but you've never really talked with them, someone from a different faith than yours. Um, and so now it's prayer time, if you want to go there. Can people also go into the banquet hall now, or do they need to wait? No, it's open. Okay, great. So if this is very informal. It's fine to move your chairs around and move around. Thank you so much for coming, everybody.